Thank you and welcome to 3PB's Defending Judicial Review webinar series. This is talk number one of three, and today's talk is going to be on pre-proceedings with a particular emphasis on good public law decision making and taking steps to avoid public law challenge in the first place. You'll see from this slide there are two other webinars coming up, one on the 22nd of June, where we're going to look at what happens post issue of proceedings, but pre permission. And that will focus on preparing your defence. And on the 12th of July, we're going to have the final talk three on what happens post permission and preparing for trial in judicial review proceedings. In terms of what we'll be discussing today, then, <clears throat> we'll start with what type of decisions we're actually talking about when we talk about challenging decisions by way of judicial review uh, with a focus on amenability. We'll cover the principles of good decision making, so how to try and avoid judicial review at all. And then we'll talk about analysing the pre-action letter, if you're unlucky enough to receive one, and preparing the pre-action response. Now, a couple of housekeeping points. There is going to be a question and answer session at the end of the talk. The chat box is active as is the Q&A box. If you can place any questions in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat, that will allow Jim and I to access them much easier. Equally, the PowerPoint will be emailed around after the event, so don't worry about that. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Matthew Wyard. I'm a public law barrister at Three Paper Buildings with a particular focus on education, health, social care, and life sciences. I'm joined today, you can see him on the screen, by my colleague Jim Hirschman, also an admin law barrister at 3PB. He focuses on education, health and social care disputes. Um, Jim, I hope I've done you justice there. If there's anything else that you want to add, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I will hand over to you for the first. Thank you very much, Matthew, and good morning to everyone. Um, so I'm covering the types of decisions we're talking about in first instance. So when will a decision be amenable to judicial review? Now, the starting point um, in that regard, just going to the next slide, is the Senior Courts Act 1981, uh, section 31. I'm sure many of you will be aware of it. Uh, and what that sets out, first of all, is that the court must grant permission to bring judicial review proceedings with reference to whether claimant has standing. Even if permission is granted, the remedy is discretionary. So that's to say permission for judicial review does not mean that the remedy the applicant seeks will be granted. Um, but third, that if permission and a remedy is refused, um, if it appears that the court are not standing the defence conduct, the outcome for the applicant would have been substantially the same, that then permission can, can be refused. So in other words, the judicial review um, needs to be in respect of a decision which if it was quashed would have a likelihood of a different decision if it were made again. And that's important because that sets the uh, starting point for judicial review is the reference point from which any defendant needs to analyze a claim that comes onto their radar. Now, subsection one of the Senior Courts Act 1981, uh, section 31, subsection one, um, makes clear that mandatory pivoting or quashing orders can be made in accordance with the rules of the court. Um, and uh, again, specifies that the claimants need to have sufficient interest in the matter to which the application relates. And that's what I was referring to in relation to standing. It also confirms that in specified circumstances, parties making an application for judicial review may seek a declaration, for example, for unlawfulness uh, or an injunction. But in terms of what can be judicially reviewed, neither the Senior Courts Act nor the civil procedure rules actually explain what type of decisions can be challenged. Which leads me on to the next slide and to Smith's judicial uh, review, his definition 
of the main touchstones of what makes a decision susceptible to JR. Uh, and there's two elements. First, you look at the source. So is the source of the decision maker a statutory provision or a provocative power? And if it's one of those two things, the next question is, does it have a public character? Does the function, does the decision have a public character? So breaking that down, first of all, uh, authority being a statute. So again, as De Smith points out, a body is a creature of statute. Uh, then all powers are ultimately derived from acts of parliament and the existence of a general power of competence does not alter this. So a good paradigm example um, of that uh, is a local authority. So you'll see there the Localism Act 2011, which sets out a local authority has the power to do anything that individuals generally may do. And section 111, subsection one of the Local Government Act 1972 also gives the local authority ancillary powers to exercise its functions. And what you have there is a very clear link of the statute empowering local authorities to act in the way that they generally do. And therefore, you've got a clear example of the statute being the source of its authority. Now, the second element is where the source is a prerogative power. Um, and what are they? Well, for that, I think you can look at the case of Miller. And there's a few elements that need to be pointed out there. So again, as most of you will know, the UK does not have a single written constitution. It's developed pragmatically as much as principally. Um, and it's been described by Dicey as the most flexible polity in existence. So originally sovereignty was concentrated in the crown, subject to limitations which were ill-defined and which changed with practical exigencies. The crown's power was eroded um, over time, over the last few hundred years, um, and it's been reduced as parliamentary democracy developed and as rule of law developed. So what you essentially have is the crown's power being taken away and subsumed by statute. And that obviously gives you the clear statutory source for one kind of decision that's subject potentially to judicial review. But there are some prerogative powers that remain. So in the case of Miller, uh, that related to the ability of ministers to exit a treaty. But it also includes, for example, the power of the Crown to decide on the terms of service for its servants, and it can alter those terms. And if you want to look into that in more uh, detail, as an example, the Council of Civil Service Unions and Minister for the Civil Service, 1985 AC374, um, illustrates that. So the prerogative power is basically what's left of the Crown's power. So if you're dealing with a power that originated in statute or is a prerogative power, the next element of the test is, is the decision of a public character? And here the case of Ames and Lord Chancellor from 2018 um, has a helpful illustration of that from Lord Justice Paul Royd. Uh, and at paragraph 55 of that judgment, um, he says three things which I think are of particular note. So first, he makes clear that whether a decision has a sufficient public law element is a question of degree. There is no universal test. In deciding whether or not it's public, the court must have regard not only to the nature, context and consequences of the decision, but also to the grounds on which the decision is challenged. And that the nature of the challenge may disclose the extent to which the decision is public or private in nature. Uh, and he illustrated it here at point three by saying that a statutory power in of itself being used is not enough to indicate there's a sufficient public or element. 
And the example he gave was of a government body negotiating commercial contracts and says the way that those contracts are negotiated will not inevitably result in judicial review challenge. But he also said the inverse is true. If a decision relates to payments to be made by a public authority pursuant to a contract, it does not mean there's not a sufficient public law element. So laboring the point perhaps slightly, but it's a decision that you need to look at in the round. And the question really is, is it a performance of a public function? Or is it merely incidental or supplementary to a public function? In many cases, that will be obvious. Uh, in some case, uh, it won't be. Um, but it's important to consider, first of all, whether the decision is amenable to judicial review at all. So that, I think, has given you a whistle-stop tour of the types of decisions that can be subjected to judicial review challenge. I'm now going to pass back to Matt to explore principles of good decision-making. So, thank you, Jen. That was really interesting. Um, shows us all that all of that reading and consideration of Dicey at university did indeed serve a purpose. Um, the next section then is on good public law decision making. Now that you have some idea of what kind of decisions can be challenged, the reality is 80, 90 percent of the time in practice, whether or not a decision is capable of being public law challenged is pretty straightforward. What practically is not so straightforward is getting the decision correct in the first place. And that's what we're going to look at now. We're going to look at two things. Firstly, I'm going to give you a checklist for decision making. Decision makers can use to ensure legality of decision making. And then having seen some of the attendees in advance of this talk, um, I'm going to talk about something that I hope will be of interest to a lot of you, which is what to do when there is a policy in place that impacts on your decision making. It's certainly something that I suspect we all see a lot in our practices. Now, in terms of the checklist, I can't take full credit for this. Um, there is an extremely good publication called The Judge Over Your Shoulder. It's, it's unless you work for the government legal department, um, in which I suspect you're uh, extremely familiar with it. It's not something that everyone is familiar with, but it's very useful guidance. It's produced by the GLD and it's publicly available online. And what it does is give a, an overview or an outline to public law decision makers who are not lawyers on how to make and take lawful decisions. Now, I've slightly... Um, bastardized the document and I'm not going to go through it line by line and I've added my own touches to it um, but broadly speaking it has four key steps that you need to take into account when you're making a decision firstly preparing to make the decision secondly investigating and gathering evidence to make the decision with thirdly actually taking the decision and then fourthly notifying people about the decision and we'll take each of those in turn starting then with preparing to make the decision there are 12 points that i've put on the screen that in my view if you apply them when you're preparing to make a decision it will help avoid common traps and pitfalls with ultimate decision making so firstly where does the power to make the decision we want to make actually come from? And what are its legal limits? Well, that's obviously important for decision makers to know because if you don't have the power to make the decision in the first place, you're at a real risk of an ultra bias challenge. Equally, joining number two, for what purpose can the power be exercised? Well, you need to have a solid understanding of what the legal limits of your decision-making abilities are and the power for which the decision is designed by the statute, if your power comes from statute, is designed to be exercised. Otherwise, you don't know that you're exercising your power for a proper purpose. And again, those of you who are familiar with this area of work will know that failure to exercise a power for a proper purpose 
can often give rise to a challenge itself. Point number three, uh, in my view, probably the most important really, besides actually ensuring you have the power to make a decision, is identifying the factors that one needs to consider when they're making the decision. And those factors can come from various sources, as we know. So sometimes they will be statutory. Sometimes they will be in government or regulatory guidance. Sometimes they will be things that are common sense about the relevant individual. Point number four we'll come back to. So whether there's a policy on the exercise of power, because that does make a difference to how the power is exercised. And we'll equally come back to legitimate expectation. Point number six is ensuring that the specific individual who takes the decision has the delegated authority to do it. There is nothing worse than having a decision get made only to find out later on down the line that the specific individual who made it never had the power to make it in the first place. It's akin to point one, really, in, in terms of ensuring that the power to make the decision you want to make is being exercised properly. Points seven through to 11 are, some might say, relatively niche. Others might say they apply to everything. Um, has devolution affected the power? Well, certainly if you're making a health decision and you want to make your decision in relation to Wales, you can't make that decision if you work for the English Secretary of State for Health, because it's a devolved issue and you wouldn't have necessarily the power to make it. Similarly, with retained EU law, perhaps not so much of an issue now, but certainly from the end of this year, uh, it, it will certainly be something that needs to be considered in, in great depth. Applying with human rights and equality legislation is something that really you should be taking advice on if you're the, the lay decision maker from your legal advisors, similarly with environmental duties. Number 12, what are the financial implications of the decision is an interesting point. Um, my view is that the first thing you need to do when you're considering the financial implications of a decision that one wants to take is actually determine if it's a relevant consideration in the first place. So to give a, to give a prime example of that, within the education setting, something that I know Jim is also very familiar with, um, there are many public law decisions that have to be taken by local authorities where the financial implication of that decision is entirely irrelevant. Um, so you need to ensure that in the first instance it's a relevant consideration and then work out how it all fits in. That being said, if you follow the 12 considerations on the slide and you can legitimately tick them all off and say you've had regard to them and you have the answers to them, you are well on your way in my view to the first step in making a lawful decision, or at least making a lawful general decision. <clears throat> what we must do when we make decisions, however, is also think about the specific individuals involved. And I think that fits nicely in with the second step of good public law decision making, which is investigating and gathering evidence with which to make your decision. So you've got step one, preparing to make the decision, that should help you identify the actual evidence you need to gather. Step two is actually gathering that evidence. And there are, on that side, I've got on the slide, six good considerations to take into account. Step one, if you've identified that your power needs to be exercised in a particular way, you need to make sure that you have enough evidence to allow yourself to actually exercise that power in that particular way. For instance, if there are particular procedural requirements, perhaps you need to give the relevant individual an opportunity to comment on a draft decision, you need to make sure that you've done that and gathered the evidence that you've done that. Step two, consideration number two, have you consulted properly? If you need to, consultation, as many of you will know, is a massively um, growing area of judicial review challenge. There seems to be an ongoing onslaught of um, procurement and consultation challenges at the moment. So if you need to consult, do so 
and do so properly at your peril. Number three, have you obtained primary evidence from the individuals concerned? That, in my view, goes without saying. You need to make sure that you can properly apply these broad topics to the specific individual who's subject of your decision making. If you don't have enough evidence about that specific individual, then you're going to struggle to satisfy anyone, let alone a judge, that you've taken into account all relevant considerations in making your decision. Point four we've touched on already, procedural fairness. Make sure that you apply with any Article 6 duty that might apply to the decision being made and that you give effectively the individual concerned a fair opportunity to comment and be involved in that decision making. Number five bias tends to come up relatively rarely, but if there is a potential that what you're doing could be perceived as being biased, you may want to think about changing a specific decision maker. Point number six um, applies to pretty much everything, um, and it could be a talk unto itself. Um, but make sure when you're making decisions, you actually comply with your data protection and freedom of information obligations. So you've done the broad brushwork, you've considered everything you need to consider, you've applied that criteria to the relevant individual. What's left is to actually take the decision. There are three big things that I think any public law decision maker needs to bear in mind when they're making their overall decision. Firstly, you've done all of this background work, make sure you take it all into account and you say so in your decision. Because if you don't, as many of us will know, someone who's impacted by the decision will find something that you haven't taken into account and you'll end up in a whole world of difficulty. So make sure you've applied everything, you've all the background work you've done properly to the individual. Number two, make sure the overall decision is proportionate. And that's obviously particularly important for things like immigration work, where you need to have a, have a real human rights focus on the decision making. And thirdly, <clears throat> I call this the common sense test. Make sure the decision you're making fits in with common sense. Is it a ridiculous decision objectively? Because if it is, then there is a high chance of a rationality challenge in the court may intervene. You probably also want to be thinking about, is this a decision that affects a large number of people? Because if so, then that is more likely to give rise to a challenge than a decision that affects one person. Fourthly then, notification. By this point, <laughs> All of the background work is done and you should have been able to reach a lawful, rational decision. Where things often fall short is in the communication of that decision. You need to think about, is there a duty on us to provide written reasons to the individual concerned in relation to who this decision is made? As lots of people will know, there's no common law duty to give reasons, but in certain circumstances, there are specific statutory requirements or guidance given that would suggest that reason should be given. Where you do decide to give reasons or there is a requirement to do so, make sure, as I've suggested earlier, that the good background work you've done comes across in your written decision. Make sure you hit all the relevant points. Make sure you explain to the relevant person concerned or organisation how you've applied any criteria, where your power to make the decision comes from, and make sure, perhaps most importantly, that you give specific reasons as to why you've reached the decision that you have. And if you do that, then you will be well on your way to preparing for, taking and communicating a lawful public law decision. Now, as I mentioned, there's quite a large number of organisations um, attending this, this talk. And something that crops up 
with larger organizations <clears throat> is policy. And as I said on the slide, those working in central government, local government, regulators, etc., will know that there are often either policy considerations or in fact written policies in place designed to assist decision makers in reaching their decision. And there's nothing wrong with that. The courts have said time and time again that having a policy in place to ensure consistency of decision making is in fact a good thing. Um, if there's inconsistency in decision making, that can give rise to its own problems. That being said, from a legal perspective, there are two key risks with policies. Firstly, the policy itself. One needs to make sure that the policy itself is lawful, rational, and consistent with human rights law. But also that when that policy is applied to specific circumstances, it's done in a lawful and rational way. Now, the key point, as I see it with policies, <clears throat> certainly in terms of the way they're drafted, is to ensure that they don't inadvertently, I suppose perhaps deliberately, fetter a decision maker's discretion when they come to make their decision. You don't want to have your defence to a judicial review challenge being, well, our policy says we need to act unlawfully, because that is not going to be an adequate decision or an adequate defence. When you're drafting policies, the key thing, I think, is to put an exceptional circumstances caveat in there to ensure that there is room to manoeuvre around the policy. There's nothing wrong with having a relatively rigid policy, but as long as there is that flexibility in there so that when certain circumstances require one to depart from that policy, there is room to do so. That is, in my view, the key thing. <clears throat> but that being said, one thing you're often asked to do as a public lawyer is to review policies. Um, and there is much more to it than just checking that the policy doesn't simply fetter a decision maker's discretion. You also need to check, and this is, this is not uncommon, that where a policy contains a statement of law, and this often occurs where policies are explaining to lay decision makers what the law is and how to apply it, you need to make sure that that statement of law is absolutely accurate and up to date because otherwise there can be a suggestion that in effect a policy sanctions an unlawful decision, which again is not a good starting point. Common sense again can flow through this, common sense check the policy, make sure it's not completely balmy, um, make sure it does what you think it's doing and make sure it fits in with whatever the proper purpose of the decision that needs to be made is. <clears throat> If you're a lawyer, make sure your client understands the effect of the policy, uh, and in particular, whether it gives rise to legitimate expectations. Equally, consider how that policy fits around other legal obligations. Is it a quality act compliant? Is it data protection compliant? Does it comply with human rights? If you want to change a policy, do we need to consult? Think about all of these things um, when you're checking the policy. And again, you should be some way to ensure that the policy itself is a lawful one. Now, back to you, Jim. Um, we've discussed policies. We've discussed application, what happens when it all goes wrong, and that letter before claim lands on your desk. Thank you very much, Matt. So the first step when you get the threatened claim, the letter before action, it lands on your desk. So first thing to consider is, is there a procedural issue? Is there a mandatory or discretionary bar which will allow you to kick out the challenge immediately? So the first issue, is it a public law decision that comes from a statutory or prerogative power? Second of all, is the correct decision being challenged there are occasions for example when you'll find a pre-action protocol letter sent but it's out of date a new decision has been made since then 
Um, and if that's the case, uh, then they should really be engaging with the most recent decision. Third, does the person have standing? Do, do they have a sufficient interest? Or are they a mere busybody? Fourth, does it comply with time limits? Is it being brought promptly? Uh, that's the test. The claim needs to be brought within three months. And the pre-action protocol letters um, should also um, be sent um, promptly. Do they have an alternative remedy? Judicial review is a remedy of last resort. Uh, and the courts don't like to use their resource. The High Court doesn't like to use its resource to determine um, an issue if there's an alternative, equally efficacious remedy available. So if you have an internal complaints process that hasn't been followed, for example, um, that's something that they should have uh, considered, provided that you're able to turn it around quickly. Uh, last, is it going to be rendered academic? Um, you often see this in challenges to local authorities, a failure to assess, for example, whether that's a vulnerable adult's needs or someone's educational provision to which they're entitled. Well, if that assessment is going to take place in short order, uh, it's very likely that the claim is going to be academic before it's brought. Uh, and again, uh, that's a good way of resolving it and putting hands up and saying we are now going to comply with our duty. So uh, once you've gone through those hurdles, consider the substantive challenge uh, and whether the, the left makes out um, and evidences some form of illegality, that the decision is rational, that it's been improperly reached. Because if they don't make out any of those uh, elements, there's a good chance that you have a defence. Um, but you should also consider whether it's otherwise defensible. After you've done that, then there's the practical considerations. Um, is it worth the time or resources of defending? Um, and within that, you're going to want to consider what's the impact of conceding the claim? Are there lots of similar claims that are likely to be brought? And you're going to end up having to fight one of them at some point. Or would failing to defend it set a precedent which might lead to a large number of claims coming your way what's the reputational impact uh, generally uh, public bodies exercising public functions um, should obviously comply with the law want to be seen to be complying with the law and want to be seen to be taking public law challenges seriously so uh, defending um, a case there's no ground to do so risks serious reputational impact Similarly, if you decide to fight uh, a claim, there's a duty of candor, which means you need to disclose anything uh, that gives a picture on the claim. Um, and defending it might uh, mean that you need to then reveal all those documents. Uh, that might be a reason not to fight it. In any event though, you should write a pre-action response uh, to a letter. Uh, there is a pre-action protocol for judicial review. I just want to highlight three of what I consider to be the most uh, important uh, points within it. So first, you've got the aims of it at paragraph three. Uh, and what that essentially is, is to understand the claim, understand each other's position, and to make an informed decision about how to proceed. It's about settling the dispute, reducing the issues, narrowing the issues, and making the task of the judge easier so they've got narrow issues and that any claim is brought on the person issues. Second of all, and this is important, a defendant should ordinarily reply to a pre-action protocol letter within 14 days of receiving it, comes from paragraph 20, or else seek an extension. So you should in any event be replying within 14 days and if you're not going to be able to do that, uh, write quickly to the applicant uh, and tell them how long you need. Uh, and of course, you should be using the template letter response, uh, which you'll find at Appendix B of that pre-action protocol. A few other things that should go into the letter. 
Um, first, I think you should investigate the substance of the complaint, ensure that you have the relevant documents, make sure that any documents the defendant hasn't seen, which might be relevant, are provided to them. So if they're, for example, suggesting that you haven't considered something as part of your decision, but you're able to evidence through a document that you have, it might be a good idea to disclose that at the pre-action uh, stage. You obviously want to push back where there's grounds to do so. So if there's any erroneous facts um, set out in the pre-action protocol, you'd want to raise them. Misunderstanding of the law, you'd want to raise that at the earliest stage. But, but last, you should also consider the cost or the inconvenience of simply remaking the decision. Often public bodies can just remake a decision, can consider it again, factor in the points made by the applicant, um, and that then um, ends the judicial review there and there because they've got the remedy that the court would in any event order. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.